I want to thank you for this opportunity to be able to share with you about, about missions, about heart cry, and about prayer. And my intention here is, is to speak about heart cry and the needs. Um, but more importantly, it's to speak about you and to encourage you with regard to your role in the Great Commission. Even if you are not directly involved in some ministry in which you are acting toward the Great Commission. I want to talk to you about prayer. I cannot overemphasize the importance, the power of preserving prayer. I cannot. And when we talk about missions, I want you to understand that I believe that prayer is the first step in missions. As a matter of fact, most of the people that I know that were called into missions, they did not begin their life going from the moment of that burden to preaching in an instant, nor did they go from the burden to instruction to prepare for ministry. But most people who have been called into missions, truly called into missions from the call, the immediate result was prayer was prayer. I see so many people are so excited about doing missions, being involved in missions. They'll study for missions, study about missions. But the great missionaries down through history that have been most effective, they knew, they knew they were called to a certain place because of the burden that was laid upon them in prayer. Now, I want you to think about that. If you think about being involved in missions, I want you to gauge that calling um, according to the burden you have for missions or a particular place in prayer. We have we're in a culture of people who are very pragmatic, very uh, given to doing things in their own power and to figuring out a way that is antithetical to the Christian life and to the Christian ministry. The tasks that we have to do in missions are an absolute impossibility. They are an absolute impossibility. That's not a cliche. It is a biblical truth. You and I cannot breathe apart from the power of God. So how will we advance his kingdom apart from the power of God? There is one way in which as a minister of the gospel, I wish that you were stronger. There's another way in which, as a minister of the gospel, I wish that you were weaker. That you would recognize your weakness and that would drive you to prayer. I would, as a minister of Christ, I would hope that you would have a greater and greater vision of who he is. But not only that, not stop there, but a greater and greater vision of the promises that he has given you. Exceedingly great promises. Not only for ministry and not only missions, but every aspect of our life. And I am just burdened that you and I have at our disposal a wealth of God's resources that we do not draw upon because we do not pray. Isn't it interesting that that in the book of Luke and then on in the book of Acts, we see something. If you've studied those books, if you've compared them to the other synoptic gospels or even to the gospel of John, you see that there is a primary theme or two primary themes flowing through Luke and into the book of Acts. One is the power of the Holy Spirit. Which we seem so desperately to need in this day, and the other is prayer. And it demonstrates that there is a direct relationship between the two, between prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you look in the life of Jesus, as it's portrayed in the book of Luke, what will you see? You will see a praying man. A man who prays. The incarnate God who has laid aside the privileges of his deity, the powers of his deity and is walking as a man relying upon his God, knowing that his God lives and moves through him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And thus he is our example. What a man of prayer. Isn't it amazing that no one ever came to Jesus and said, teach me how to cast out demons. No one ever came to Jesus and said, teach me how to walk on water. But his disciples came to him and said, teach me to pray. Teach us to pray. 
Many people say that if they could see anything in the New Testament, they would long to see, for example, Paul preaching on Mars Hill. Others say I would long to have sat at the feet of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. For me, if I could pick any moment, I would long to see Jesus as he was alone in secret prayer to his God. Now, I want to I've got some promises, some some quotes. Normally, I, you know, don't spend a lot of time just quoting men. But these quotes are such an encouragement to me, and I want them to be an encouragement to the church. I want you to see this. I want you to feel it. I want you to believe it. I want you to 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 grab a hold of it and not let go of some of the things that are going to be said. First of all, I'd like to mention to you James James Frazier. He was a missionary to the Lisu people in China. Now, this man was a biblical man. This was a man who understood that missions is about truth. And he believed in proclaiming the scriptures. And I say that as a preface to this amazing quote that I'm going to read. Listen to what he said. I used to think that prayer should have the first place and teaching the second. I now feel it would be truer to give prayer the first, second and third places and teaching the fourth. Now, that is an amazing statement. Do not think that he's diminishing the importance of the word or its proclamation. He is not. He proved it with his lifestyle. But look at what he's saying. Let's go on and look at some other quotes. They're just amazing. First, by John R. Mott. It is possible for the most obscure person in a church with a heart right toward God to exercise as much power for the evangelization of the world as it is for those who stand in the most prominent positions. Saints, are you hearing what this is saying? And I want to tell you that on the day of judgment, I think we're going to see a mighty reversal in which we see some of the most prominent preachers not necessarily that they're going to be cast down. But we're going to see that behind some of the most prominent preachers were saints who no one ever saw that were interceding for them constantly. I believe that when God raises up a man, raises up a ministry, he will also raise up saints who in secret pray for that person all the days of their life. And they are the reason, the human reason for that one man's prominence and power. That's a humbling thing, isn't it? But it encourages you, doesn't it? I remember one time a group of us decided that we were going to pray for our pastor. He was a powerful preacher, truly powerful preacher. We decided that one day we would, after church, we wouldn't go out to eat on Sunday. We wouldn't do anything like that, but that we would all gather there by the pulpit and we would pray for several hours before the night service. It was just a lot of college guys. I'm not saying this will happen every time. But when that man got up to pray, got up to preach Sunday night, immediately you knew he was energized. You knew that something was going on. And then throughout that sermon, he preached with such power. Don't think this is unique to history. We have the same. This was the boast of Charles Spurgeon when someone wanted to know where's the power source of this church. He took them to the prayer meeting while they were praying for the preacher while the preacher was preaching. Goes on and he says this, he says, Dick Eastman says, in no other way can the believer become as fully involved with God's work, especially the work of world missions as in intercessory prayer. Do you believe that? And maybe if you want to be a missionary, maybe this is where you cut your teeth. You want to be in the ministry, you want to be a preacher, you want to go out and be a Bible woman or you want to do all sorts of things in the name of Christ. Maybe this is the place you begin. This is where you cut your teeth. And look at the impact you can have. A man who is working in missions 18 hours a day is not as involved in missions if he does not pray as the saint who prays a half an hour a day for missions. You see how this church can be involved in missions? Do you see how you you can ask God for the burden of a country and pray for that country all the days of your life? You can have such an impact on the world without ever leaving, without ever leaving your home. 
Emmy uh, Andros said, the man on his knees has a leverage underneath the mountain which can cast it into the sea and can force all earth and heaven to recognize the power that is in Christ's name. Now, is this not amazing? You know, everybody. Looking at preachers, looking at preaching, looking at all the people who stand up for you know what people are really looking for. They want to see power. They want to see reality. They want to see actually a demonstration of power, as Paul spoke about. You know, in this church, and I have been in many churches, I've been in church longer than some of you have been alive. I want you to know something I have seen in this church. With this little flock, as many answers to prayer in this short time as I have seen in any place else. But don't sit there and pat yourself on the back. Realize you haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg. You haven't even reached the foothills of this Everest. You're still on the plains. There's so much more, so much more. You know, what's a great thing is when people come to a preacher who has some measure of success in the things of God, and they cannot, after looking at him, after listening to him, after watching him preach, they cannot figure out how is it that this man is used. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Secret and abiding prayer. Now, look what he says here. Charles Spurgeon, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Now that's Spurgeon. No one exalted preaching, probably as much as Spurgeon. And look what he says, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. This is amazing. Robert, Evan Roberts said, prayer is the secret of power. It is. The secret of power. Robert Spear, the evangelization of the world depends first upon a revival of prayer deeper than the need for workers, deeper far than the need for money. Deep down at the bottom of our spiritual lives is the need for the forgotten secret of prevailing worldwide prayer. There is you can't turn over a pebble. Christ can turn over mountains and cast them into the sea, cast them farther than the universe. Prayer. And not just for missions, church, for every need, for every, every need of your life. You have a spiritual need, pray. Financial need, pray. Physical need, pray. No need, pray. Just pray. Goes on to say, John R. Mott says the missionary church is a praying church. The history of missions is a history of prayer. Everything vital to the success of the world's evangelization evangelization hinges on prayer. Do you believe that? You know, one of the great problems when you believe biblically in the sovereignty of God, you know, what one of the problems is you arrive at that conclusion by submitting to the scriptures, not by human reason. How do how is it that you believe God is sovereign over all things? It is not by human reason. It is not by observation. It is by believing the word of God. But here's the problem. Many people through believing the word of God come to the understanding that God is all sovereign. But then they depart from scripture and start using human reason to figure out how that applies to the world. And since God is all sovereign and he's decreed all things, there's no need to pray. Since God has elected people, there's no need for evangelization or missions. That's when you depart from scripture and you start standing upon human reason. If you came to understand the sovereignty of God only through the scriptures, then you must figure out the application only through the scriptures. And what do we see? God is all sovereign. What do we see? You have not because you ask not. You must believe in the power and the importance of prayer. You must. You must. You must. Dr. Um, well, John R. 
Dr. A.C. Dixon says this, when we rely upon organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely upon eloquence, we get what eloquence can do and so on. But when we rely upon prayer, we get what God can do. What kind of life do you want? I mean, honestly, what kind of life do you want? A life that can be explained by your education. You want a ministry that can be explained just by circumstance and opportunity. What do you want? Do you want a life that cannot be explained except because of the gracious providence of God? The power of God. Then you must be a person of prayer. Andrew Murray, he said this without prayer, even though there may be increased interest in missions, more work for them, better success in organization and greater finances, the real growth of the spiritual life and of the love of Christ in the people may be very small. See, you, you may create all sorts of things. I mean. Young people, listen to me. I have seen so much dust stirred in the air only to see it all settled to the ground and there's nothing there. I have seen so much activity, so much smoke without fire. I have seen it. I have seen it. The best laid plans of mice and men. They come to nothing. Only the power of God. Only the power of God. David Bryant says this prayer is action by it. We step out in advance of all other results. Now, I want you to think about that. Today, the idea is I'm going to step out into the ministry. I'm going to step out into action. Maybe you need to step down into prayer. This is what we all need. This is what you need to hear. It's what I need to hear, even though I be preaching it. It's what I need to hear. Church, I want to tell, I want to encourage you at the success of prayer that we have seen. Some of you are holding children because of it. Some of you have homes because of it. So many of you have jobs because of it, because of prayer, specific answered prayer. So often in this church that we cannot, even the worst skeptic, cannot write it down as circumstance. And yet. You haven't even reached the incline. We're still on flat plane. That shouldn't make you sad. That should make you very, very encouraged. Prayer by action. By, prayer is action. By it we step out in advance of all other results. Praying is an activity upon which all others depend. By prayer we establish a beachhead for the kingdom among peoples where it has never been before. Prayer strikes the winning blow. All other missionary efforts simply gather up the fruits of our praying. It's cleanup. Prayer is the battle. Everything else is cleanup. You might say, well, brother, I have success in ministry and I've heard men say this. I have heard men say this. I've heard them write it, say I've had success in ministry, yet I am not a man of prayer. Well, first of all, they could be deceived. They're already deceived enough not to see in the scriptures that prayer is absolutely essential. But it, it, I suppose it would be possible. Because all of us have more success than what we pray for. I, I suppose it would be possible for a man to have some fruit without praying. But I'll guarantee this on the day of judgment, when he stands there. All of a sudden, many other people unknown to him will be called forth and they will be called and charged with the reason for his success. It's like a story. It's probably not true, but it makes for a great illustration. A preacher who was known for his power, known for conversions, all sorts of things. All of a sudden, one day, it just all dried up. Everything, everything dried up. He searched his life, everything else. He could find no outstanding sins. Finally, one day, a widow woman came to him. Recently widowed woman, old, old saint came to him and said. Power's gone. The power's gone. 
And he said, yes, the power is gone. She said, do you want to know why? He said, yes, I want to know why. She took him out of his office. She led him down the hallway. To the broom closet. She opened it up. She said, this was my husband's office. He was the janitor of the church. Pastor, he would clean up with all the speed his old body would allow. And then spend the rest of his day on his knees in this broom closet for you. I know churches, I know personally churches that stand. I know churches that have experienced some measure of revival because of a few women in that church who spent their lives on their knees. But look at how encouraging this is. To pray for our children, to pray for our wives, to pray for our husbands, to pray, to pray, to pray for church members, to pray for the church collectively, to pray collectively as a church. But church, please understand this. Collective prayer. Becomes it becomes sweeter and more powerful to the degree that we as individuals spend secret time in prayer. Please remember this. John Mott said prayer alone. Will overcome the gigantic difficulties which confront the workers in every field. Have I not said a million times that the more we cut ourselves free from trusting in the arm of the flesh, the more we will see God. The two things. Trusting in the flesh, trusting in intelligence, trusting in human cleverness and wisdom and human strategies, doing all that, all it does is decline. Decrease the empower, the power of God that will be manifested in a congregation. Simple. Quiet. Intelligent. Passionate, praying. I look forward with great fondness on the day when I stand before God and I see the saints totally unknown to me that are the real reason for the advance of heart cry. It will be humbling. I've already prepared my heart for it. I continue to pray, prepare my heart for it. When everyone realizes that it was not the director. It was not the leader of administration. It was not necessarily even the pastor. It was not the staff. But hidden saints that God raised up to pray. It's amazing. See, that's why as a minister, you need to walk in humility now. So that it won't look so bad when you experience humility later. If you acknowledge it now, it will not be painful on the day of judgment, but it'll be joyful. Finally, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. He does. He'll laugh at everything else. He will laugh at everything else. Laugh, laugh, laugh. He will laugh. All our intelligence, all our arguments, all our organization, everything. With one breath, one vile breath. In one millisecond, he'd destroy everything we think we've accomplished. But the praying saint, he fears the praying saint. He does. And with good reason. You look in the book of Revelation, you have this people of God, they're despised, they're hated, they're considered the scum of the earth. They have no political, no economic power at all. Nothing do they have. And they're praying there in the midst of that giant Roman Empire and they're crying out to God. If someone had walked into the room, they would have thought them mad, feeble, sick, useless. And yet the scriptures say that their prayers ascended up into heaven were mixed 
with incense and cast back down to the earth with the power of earthquakes, lightning and thunder. Can you imagine that when you bow your knee? You need to. These are not exaggerated metaphors. They're not exaggerated enough. That when you bow your knee and cry out to God about the highest mountains in this world, the highest mountains, governments, perverted worldviews, everything, and you cry out to God, your prayers are sent back down to this earth with the power of lightning and thunder and earthquakes. But when the Son of Man returns, will he find this kind of faith on the earth? Let him find it here. Let him find it in your prayer closet. A believing man, a believing woman, a believing boy, a believing girl who will take God seriously. Well, that was the admonition for prayer. I hope you're encouraged. Now we have a series of guidelines. I'm just going to go through them briefly and then turn the service back over to, to Pastor Anthony. If you want to have a more extensive guideline, go for guideline for prayer on the Heart Cry website. And most of this is there and even more. But just some things on how to pray. Pray that the gospel might be proclaimed to all the nations. Pray that. To pray for that is more than to participate in it. Pray for that, that God's name be great among the nations, that the kingdom of Christ, the gospel of the kingdom might be preached to the whole world as a testimony. And then pray for the kingdom. If you understand rightly the Lord's prayer, you see it's the most powerful prayer that you can possibly pray. And it sets in order everything else in your life. The three petitions are three, and yet they are one. Hallowed be thy name, that God's name be unique. Considered unique, special, above, transcendent, more worthy, more supreme than all other names, persons, places on this planet. And along with reverence to God, thy kingdom come that his rule invade every country and every heart. It's not done by by physical material warfare. It's not done by strategy. It's done by calling out to God. And then not only that, that his will be done, which is the advancement of his kingdom into the heart of a human being will ensure that God's will will be done. That's why we need to pray for the kingdom, the advance thereof, for a greater missionary force. Pray for laborers to be sent out into the harvest. Pray that they be biblical. And pray for heart cry. That our staff. Those who are involved in heart cry may walk in integrity. Give me a man of integrity over every gifted man on the planet. He'll be the one I take. Give me the uninstructed man with character and integrity. I'll take him over everyone else on the planet. A man of integrity, wisdom and the fear of the Lord, not only before God, but before men. That heart cry donors might be prospered in all things concerning the will of God, my chief Prayer always for the heart cry donors is this, that their families, their entire lives be marked by salvation in the fullest sense of the term. That the missionaries supported by heart cry might increase in grace, conformity to Christ and usefulness of God. Again, we go back to this. Everything has to do when it comes to talking about usefulness in service after prayer, after knowledge of the scripture. Is that Christ be formed in us. What we lack more than anything on this planet are men and women of integrity. Of moral certainty. Of moral absolute. Of the fear of the Lord. And then we have some specific requests here. They are extremely important. We have Peru, India, Africa, Middle East. Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Indonesia and Russia. And we have certain prayer requests that I've written down. I've asked different staff members to also uh, give their idea with regard to this. Be encouraged, church. As we pray now, be encouraged. But d don't just think about this for <laughs> corporately. Don't just think about it for missions. Every aspect of your life, every aspect 
of your life turned over to prayer. Every need taken to the throne. That's how men have peace. That's how you gain peace, not through circumstance. Circumstance will never give you peace. It will cheat you. It will give you a pretended momentary peace and then snatch it away from you and throw you to the ground and break you to pieces. No, peace comes from lifting up every preoccupation, every worry, every need to Christ, to Christ, to Christ. One other thing for you young people who would like to learn how to pray without ceasing. To pray with perseverance and not give up. Know this. It is. Specific time alone with God in the prayer closet that leads to being able to pray without ceasing throughout your entire day. I would heartily recommend to you young people fix a time of meeting with God. Fix a time of meeting with Christ. Fix a time to speak with him. Another thing that you may want to think about that's no rule of scripture, but it's been helpful for me. The first part of the day. I must give to what my flesh hates most. My flesh hates praying more than it does studying scripture. Why? Because if I study scripture, I grow in knowledge and I can boast in that and I can demonstrate it to other men. My flesh hates praying, so let's wrestle that thing the first part of the day. Now, some people would say, no, I go to Scripture first because I hear from God. That is fine. Again, I said it's not written in Scripture. I just know for me. The one area where Satan is going to most try to distract me. Is in prayer. It's going to try to get me there. Also know this, that all your knowledge will be rot. Unless it is birthed, incubated, cultivated in an attitude of prayer. Knowledge without prayer. You know what it's like? A man who has knowledge, and no prayer. What's well, that idea of a wise man? A trained doctor with a scalpel can do surgery and save a person from cancer. A fool with the same scalpel will murder everyone he touches. Knowledge without prayer. It's a dangerous thing. And if you've got a handle on it right now, know this, that if you continue without prayer, you will not have a handle on it. Sooner or later, it will escape you and you will become a deadly force. Pray, pray about everything, everything. There is nothing secular in the Christian life. Do you understand that? Every desire lift up to God. Unless scripture dictates that it's a wrong desire, lift it up to God, keep lifting it up to God until he makes it known, either does it or makes it known to you that you are to be quiet. And oftentimes he will do that by simply taking the desire away from your heart. But pray, pray, dear saints, young children, pray. If you consider yourself Christian, if you take the supper, if you've been baptized, pray, pray. Winston Churchill said something in simplicity in World War II, and because of its simplicity, it was never forgotten. He looked at the British people who were suffering and he said, never, never, never give up. Jesus is saying basically the same thing in Luke 18. Never, never, never stop praying. Pastor.